All right, just going to do a quick video going through a video by JackSmack77 where he is actually uh, proving he is an antinomian and defending his wicked antinomian heresy. He actually says that you can be practicing homosexuality and still be saved, basically. Not have any conviction or godly sorrow, essentially, because he rejects that. Because why? He's never experienced it. He's so lost hell than a sinner. He's never experienced the new birth that comes as a result of salvation. But let's get right into refuting this heretical video by Jack Smack 77. He's actually attacking a brother in Christ named Michael Miller, who rightfully said that you cannot be saved and be practicing homosexuality. And what he meant by that is that you basically, what he likely meant is that you can't be, essentially have no conviction over practicing homosexuality, something that the Bible calls an abomination in Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13. But let's get right into refuting this video and just proving that Jack Smack 77, uh, he calls Michael Murphy an unsaved liar. Well, Jack Smack 666, as he should be properly known as, he's the one that's the unsaved liar. So, let's get into refuting this. Okay, this sermon is entitled, Michael Murphy is an unsaved liar. I'd like to open up with prayer. And then with a few verses, all right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, praying to your father, Lucifer. That's the God he's praying to, the God of this world. See, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4. Psalm 120 reads, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips, and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Now, who is Michael Murphy? Michael Murphy used to come on my channel, and I thought he was free grace. I found out he's like 17 years old or something. He's a very immature stupid idiot uh, we're going to see at the end of this video that it's Jack Smack 666 who's the immature little brat uh, who is on full display showing his immaturity so get some stuff out of the way so we're going to see who really is the immature child at the end of this video basically and now he's following devils and he believes in a total works based salvation we're going to take a listen to a few of his clips and then you can decide for yourself if you think he's saved or not. So here's his first clip. Here goes. I have a, a son of my friend who got married to his boyfriend, and Jack Smack said that person's saved. Now, of course, Stephen Anderson. Well, why wouldn't he be saved if he believes the gospel? Oh, okay. So, in other words, I can be practicing homosexuality and still be saved as long as I believe the gospel. But there's no changed life, there's no conviction of sin. You see, this is the antinomian gospel. You can practice homosexuality, something the Bible calls an abomination in Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13, and I can still be saved, basically, just because I believe the gospel. Okay? And we're going to see that, you know, there were sodomites among the early church, but they were they had a changed life. Okay? And it's not work salvation, it's, it's the results of biblical salvation. Now, he's objecting to this because he does not believe that you could be gay and saved, or a, a practicing, active gay and be saved. Well, I guess Paul was unsaved, too. Let's see about that. Because um, you can be saved and be in all kinds of, of messed up sins, absolutely, but there will be a change that happens in your life, and it can take years for some people. It can, it can be a lifetime process of sanctification. It's not just going to happen overnight. Because you read about that in Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, homosexual attraction is uh, it's against nature. It's, it's they're lusting after each other. So it can take a while for that uh, that perversion to be broken. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 down to verse 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Let's stop right there. What is the kingdom of God? Okay, Romans 14, 17 identifies the kingdom of God as spiritual fellowship with God. That's Romans 14, 17. Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, talk about how the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God is spiritual. Now, there are cases in the Gospels where kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably. Okay, that is true. However, the kingdom of God has two meanings, which is the kingdom of heaven. You run the references. Let me just show you that. That word kingdom of heaven only appears in the, in the uh, Gospel of Matthew. 
nowhere else is it up here. The kingdom of heaven. See, all the verses are in the Gospel of Matthew. Kingdom of heaven. Why? Because Jesus Christ is preaching the physical earthly kingdom to the Jewish people. Okay, you, in Matthew chapter 11, verse uh, 12, the kingdom of heaven can suffer the violence and the violence taken by force. Paraphrasing, of course. But the kingdom of heaven can suffer violence and be taken by force. Because it's the physical earthly kingdom. Now, the kingdom of God is used sometimes to refer to the kingdom of heaven interchangeably. Yes. But the kingdom of God also can be can, is referring to the spiritual kingdom. That's what a lot of the non-dispensational heretics like Jack Smack 7-7 get confused over. And that's what a lot of the... the the Lord Shippers and the, the conditional security heretics like Jesse Morell, Ribbon Israel, Richard Pekoski, they get that messed up too because they'll say, see, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. See, you can lose your salvation if you do these sins. Well, hold on a second. The kingdom of God is not uh, heaven, God's dwelling place. The kingdom of God is spiritual fellowship with God. So, basically, you get out of fellowship with God when you do these sins. However, you don't lose your salvation because you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 1.13, Ephesians 4.30, and 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, say that you're, uh, sorry, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 3 to 5, yeah, say that you're kept by the power of God, and you have a place in heaven reserved for you that does not fade away. And there's other examples too, like John chapter 20, 10, verse 28 and 29, you're saved by Jesus Christ, you'll never perish. John 5.24 says you will not come into condemnation. Uh, John 6.29 says you will not be lost. You know, Jesus Christ will not lose you. So there's plenty of examples that refute the Catholic heresy of conditional security. But let's get into this verse, because what he's saying is that you can be practicing homosexuality and essentially be saved and be in fellowship with God. You know, he, he'll say, well, I don't believe that. When it comes down to it, that's what he does believe. He can deny it, but that's what, he, that's what it comes down to. Uh, but just have to point that out, but the whole thing of the difference between kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, because non-dispensational heretics like Jack Smack 7-7 don't know the difference. Uh, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abuse themselves of mankind, because that's what sodomite acts are. They're abusing yourself of mankind. Again, you read Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. They're not loving each other, they're burning and lust after each other. And what they do is against nature, men with men. So they are abusing themselves of mankind, which covers sodomites. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But notice what Paul says, in light of Jack Smack 7, 7 saying, well, you could be uh, a practicing gay, biblical term is sodomite, you can be a practicing gay and uh, be saved and you know be a Christian. Look what Paul says uh, in verse 11, and such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So you got Paul saying that there were sodomites who got saved among the early Corinthian church, but such were some of you. They are no longer have those sodomite attractions. Why? Because they had spiritual regeneration from the Holy Ghost. But you got Jack Smack 7 7 saying, there's no changed life, that's heresy, that's lordship salvation, and you just continue living in sin, and there's no there's no godly sorrow over your sins. So, it comes down to that either you believe Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, or you believe Jack Smack 666, talking under the inspiration of his father, Satan. I think I'll go with the uh, Paul, Paul, the Apostle Paul, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Such were some of you. There were Sodomites among the early church, but they got saved, and they had a changed life. Suttling Jack Smack 77666, proper name Jack Smack 666, has never experienced because he's not saved. He's still lost and dead in trespasses and sins. And I get no joy out of saying that. But it's a sad reality. Let's continue. He, he, he's going to go on to try to use David as uh, King David as, as proof that, oh, well, you know, he, he'd sinned and you know, he's still saved. You know, So apparently people were being saved in the Old Testament before, before the crucifixion, getting ahead of myself. So right up front, he's proving that he believes in a works-based salvation. Let's continue here. Here goes. It's wrong to say that person can't get saved. Uh, proof on that? Uh, a works-based salvation that you have to basically continually do works to save yourself? Um, no, he's not teaching a works-based salvation. You know, uh, Having God to serve over your sin is not works salvation. Give me a break. Of course, they can still get saved, but they're not saved. This well, according to him, they can't even get saved. If they're unwilling to turn from their homosexuality and repent of that, they can't even get saved. 
So he's denying the fact that you can be gay and saved. And well, I guess Paul was, was lost too because he also was denying the fact that you can be gay and inherit the kingdom of God, be in fellowship with God. Basically, again, you will not lose your salvation, but you'll get out of fellowship with God. You see, Jack Smack 7 7, he is trying to downplay and really trying to, trying to take a light attitude towards sin. That's what it comes down to. That, that's why he hates it when you point out his sin, his playing that wicked video game Grand Theft Auto. A game all about crime and violence and, and theft and, and, and drugs and all that kind of stuff. Alcoholism, heavy drinking, you know. And he's teaching that you have to stop being gay to be saved, according to him. Let's keep listening to no, this. He's not saying you have to stop being gay to be saved. He's saying you have God the sorrow, and then when you do get saved, after your salvation, you see that? After your salvation, the Holy Ghost comes in and changes your life, cleans your life up. It's called spiritual regeneration. Okay, that's something that both the antinomians and the lordship work salvationists both have no understanding of, because the the lordship work salvationists like Reuben Israel, Jesse Morrell, Richard Pinkowski, they're trying to basically clean themselves up and try to earn merit salvation by their own self righteousness, like Paul talks about in uh, Romans chapter ten verse three. They're trying to establish their own righteousness rather than submit to the righteousness of God. Okay, so they have no understanding of the of the new birth because they have never experienced that. They're still trying to they're stuck in self righteousness. But then you got the easy believism heretics who also have no understanding of the new birth and think you can just live however you want and there's no conviction or change that comes after salvation. Neither one is right. You have a false dichotomy. Neither side is right. Both sides are filled with heresy. This isn't something you do. This is that some Christians can be carnal and backslid in for a time. Yes. Yes, they can. That's what pra uh, being a practicing gay is. It's being carnal. We're backslidden. But he's getting ready to deny this. Let's keep listening. Here goes. Okay, I'm not denying that because I'm not a lordship salvationist, but... Actually, he is a lordship salvationist. Uh, actually, Jack Smack 666, you have zero understanding of what lordship salvation is. Okay? Lordship salvation is essentially self-righteousness. It's, it's self-righteousness. Uh, it's simply... Essentially trying to merit, essentially trying, it's, it's just basically Roman Catholicism. It's all it is. It's Roman Catholic heresy. You're trying to basically merit your salvation by your holiness and self righteousness. That is heresy. That's not what Michael Murphy was saying. Okay, he was saying that you can be carnal, but then you're not going to continue being a sodomite. There will eventually be a change in your life, and again, it can take years of sanctification, but it will eventually happen. You know, for new Christians, it can take a little while, but for Christians who have been saved for 10, 10 20, 30 years. You know, there will be the sanctification process that would kick in. But let's keep going. Here goes. This is not being carnal and backslidden. This is something only an unsaved person would do. Only an unsaved person would be gay. That's total lordship salvation, but let's keep listening. Uh, you, again, you have no idea of what lordship salvation is. And I guess what Paul lordship salvation is too, because he said such were some of you among the early church. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11. So I guess Paul was he a lordship salvationist as well? Interesting. Kill someone. A saved person can kill somebody. Which according to him. King David was guilty of murder, and there's all sorts of accounts of people in the scripture that were murderers. Yeah, we're we're gonna get to King David, because they always love to use King David. Oh look, King David, he committed murder and adultery. Yeah, we're gonna see what happened to King David when he did those sins. Because it, it didn't go unpunished. We're just gonna keep that in mind. You see, these heretics, these antinomian heretics, always try to look for someone in the Old Testament. They'll, they'll search the scriptures in the Old Testament looking for someone who committed sins to try to justify their own sins. Okay, But they don't read the part. See, they'll read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, where King David commits those sins. But they don't read the next couple of chapters, chapters 12 to 16, where there's the punishment for those sins. They, don't, they leave that part out because... They have no standards, okay? They do not teach against, they do not teach that there is chastening, they don't, I mean, some of them may do that, but a lot of them will essentially say that you can just live however you want, and there's no chastening, there's no punishment from God. So, we're going to get into what happened to King David in a little bit. And every single person alive has murdered Jesus Christ by putting him on the cross by their sins, so he's denying that salvation is by grace. According to uh, He's not denying salvation is by grace. Okay, that's just, that's just ridiculous, okay? Grace is not earned by your works. Grace is a free gift, okay? Romans 5, verses 15 to 18 uh, says, talks about grace being a free gift. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 talks about how you're justified freely by his grace, okay? Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 6 
uh, for, I think it's Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9 and 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 8 to 9 all talk about how your grace is not earned by your works, by your self-righteousness. Absolutely, okay? Grace is a free gift, absolutely. Anyone who, den anyone who, de do who denies that is, heres is, is in heresy, okay? But Michael Murphy is teaching a false grace. He's teaching that you basically turn God's grace into lasciviousness, like Jude 1 4 talks about. You know, that you use liberty for an occasion to the flesh, like Galatians 5 13 talks about. See, these are scriptures he won't show his followers. Because they're living in sin and they're trying to use liberty to justify their sin. Him, how do you get saved? It's not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's don't be gay. It's don't be a murderer. Or it's repent of all those sins. Yeah, okay. Acts, it, see, they always love to go to Acts 16.31. These guys always love to rip that verse out of context. Acts 16.31. Acts 16.31. Acts 16.31. How about you read the context of that verse, which begins at verse 25. Okay? Down to verse 25 up to verse 31, the full context, the Philippian jailer was going to kill himself. Okay? He came to the apostles trembling, saying, what must I do to be saved? And at that point, they told him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know why they didn't preach repentance to him? Because he was already in a repentant state. He already had conviction in godly sorrow. So there's no need to preach repentance to him because he already was showing repentance. So at that point, they just told him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's going on in the context of Acts 16.31, which again begins down to verse at verse 25, Acts 16.25. So he never shows his viewers the context of Acts 16.31. He just loves ripping these verses out of context to justify their heresies. To justify his heresies and pretty much anti any antinomian will do that to justify their heresies. And basically live a good life and do works. He's a work salvationist. Oh, he never said you live a good life to be saved. That's ridiculous. Totally lying about what he said. So it would seem the only unsaved liar here is you, Jack Smack six six six. Now this last quote of his proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's not saved. So let's take a listen to it. Here goes. Life. Just because I reject easy believism, doctrine of devils, doesn't mean that I don't believe in that promise. Okay, because I also reject work salvation. So my question He just said he rejects easy believism, calls it a doctrine of devils, and then he says he has the temerity to say that it doesn't mean I don't believe that promise. Actually it does mean that you don't believe the promise. Now when it comes to the term of easy believism, I try to avoid that term, me personally, because salvation is easy. Okay, it is easy to get saved. Okay. Salvation is not a hard, or difficult process like in Roman Catholicism or in Islam or, or Talmudic Judaism or pretty much any religion. Okay? Salvation is easy. That's simple. By grace through faith, not by your own works, not by your self righteousness. Like Ephesians two, eight and nine says, not of yourselves. Romans three twenty eight, you know, not of you know, uh, not by works, you know, because it talks about your you can boast then if you're saved by your works. But you see, he's preaching a false grace, okay? Salvation is easy, but when I say, when I refer to easy believism, I'm referring to Jack Smack 666 and his ilk, where they have this gospel of no repentance, no godly sorrow, uh, there's no changed life after salvation, there's no new birth, you just keep living however you want, and there's just no conviction or chastening from God. That's what I'm attacking when I say easy believism. The gospel of no repentance, the gospel of just essentially do, do what that will, it should be the whole of the law, the satanic philosophy of Aleister Crowley. That's what it comes down to. Okay, if you reject easy believism, you are rejecting faith in Christ. You don't believe the promise. You don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're unsaved, and you're going to hell, you stupid unsaved devil, liar, Michael Murphy. Yeah, so that little, just a little blowout from Jack Smack 77 just a little immature kid that he is. But on a thing of a changed life, okay? Paul taught a changed life after salvation, okay? Uh, Ephesians 2.10, you're created for good works. You're his workmanship created for good works. You're paraphrasing, of course, that's Ephesians 2.10. 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, you know, you're a new creature in Christ. All things that have passed away, behold, all things become new. Like I said, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, you're, you're uh, such were some of you. The changed life is found all throughout scripture. You have example, for example, uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, which says, uh, what, uh, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
Shall we keep playing Grand Theft Auto and going to the bar and getting drunk and, and binge drinking on alcohol or or uh, defending our wicked violent video games? You know, not not video games that are clean and pure and played in moderation, but I'm saying like wicked, uh, hyper violent crime field video games, games that encourage street crime, like Grand Theft Auto. Shall we keep doing that? The grace may abound. What does Paul say in verse two? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, sin will kill you at some point. It will mess you up. Romans 6.15 uh, What say then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Shall we keep playing Grand Theft Auto? Should we keep you know, engaging in homosexuality because we are not under the law? What does Paul say? God forbid. Uh, another good scripture. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the image of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay? You present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And we're going to get into what happened to King David after I cover this one last scripture. Because these people always love to use King David. They look, they look for a bigger sinner to try to justify their sins. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, down to verse 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live righteously, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You know? Again, compare that to Romans 12, 1. Be not conformed to the image of this world. Or verse 2 of Romans 12. And Romans 1, uh, 12, verse 1. You present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Sorry, post-tribbers. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. We're looking for the appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not for the Antichrist. So, sorry to all the post-tribbers out there. Post-trib post -trib rapture is a lie. Okay? We get called out before the before the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Sorry to the Catholics out there who say, oh, you have to attend Mass to have your sins forgiven. No. When you're saved, you're redeemed from all iniquity. And to purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of of uh, a carnal worldliness. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. Uh, zealous of violent video games. Oh no, zealous of sexual perversion. Oh no, it doesn't say that either. Zealous of good works. Okay? Again, compare it to Ephesians uh, 2.10. You're created for good works. You're his workmanship, created for good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. This passage of Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 15 condemns three different heresies. Okay? It condemns the antinomian heresy of no changed life and no holy living. It condemns the post-tribbers in verse 13 because you're looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ not the Antichrist and it condemns the Catholic heresies and a lot of the Lordship heresies because it says in verse 14 that he might redeem us from all iniquity not just your past sins so all your sins forgiven so three different heresies kicked in this one small passage very very interesting but let's get into what happened to King David because they always love you as King David to justify their own sins because what happened in verse or 2 Samuel chapter 11 Basically what happened is that, I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, but David, he sent Uriah into the battle purposefully to get him killed so he could commit adultery with his wife. That's what's going on there. And they say, see, look what David did. You know, he he um, he uh, uh, committed adultery. You know, he, he murdered someone's husband or someone's husband on purpose so he could commit adultery. Okay, but let's, let's see what happened to King David at, as a result. So first of all, in, in chapter uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 to uh, 14 he's rebuked by Nathan but look at verse or verses down uh, verses 15 to 23 of 2 Samuel chapter 12 let's read that one and Nathan departed unto his house and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David and it was very sick David therefore besought God for the child and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth and the elders of, the, of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day, interesting seven, because seven is the number of completion. God created the earth in seven days. God rested on the seventh day. You know, there's, there's seven years in the time of Jacob's trouble. 
it ends on the seventh year. There is uh, seven dispensations. You know, very very interesting. Seven is the number of completion. Uh, and be and uh, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth, and washed, and anointed himself, and changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord, and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, uh, required they sat, uh, they set bread before him, and he did eat. I got mixed up there for a second. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou did not uh, fast and weep for the child while it was yet alive, but when the child was dead, thou did, didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? Uh, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Shall I go to him? Uh, but he shall not return to me. Basically, what's going on is that God killed the child that he had with Uriah through adultery. So, yeah, King David did commit some sins in chapter 11, but look at the results. God killed his child. You know, and you read down, you go down to chap, don't, don't go down to chapter 16 of Second Samuel chapter 2. God punished David for, for what he did. King David did not just get away with it with no punishment. And a good scripture that kind of ties into that is Psalms 51. You see, something that David had that Jack Smack 7 7 seems to forget is David had conviction and godly sorrow for what he did. Psalms 51, and read the whole chapter, or sorry, the whole chapter, not, not chapter, the whole psalm of Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thro thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Hmm. Something you'll never see Jack Smack 7 7 say. Oh God, wash me from my sin. Cleanse me from my sin. You see, because he is stuck in pride and self-righteousness. You know, he thinks, oh, I believe in Jesus, you know. Never asked God to save him. Never came to God with godly sorrow. You know. Never said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, in Luke 18, verse 9 to 14. No, they're prideful. They won't admit to that. Him, him and his cult followers. Uh, verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Something Jack Smack 7 7 never does. He never acknowledges his sin or his transgressions. But David did. So David had humbleness. He realized, yeah, I'm, I'm a filthy sinner. Look what I've done. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou might be, mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Sorry to all the sinless perfection heretics out there. Who say, oh, oh, we can be sinless in his flesh. No, you can't. Okay? Sa sinless perfectionism is a satanic heresy. There's, there's no nice way to put it. The reason why I say it's satanic is because essentially, a sinless, and I'm not going to get too much into this, but sinless perfectionism, essentially what it comes down to is you're trying to become your own God. You're trying, you're trying, you're trying to become sinless like God. And who is the one that said, ye shall be as gods? Satan. In, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 14, Satan was saying, I'll be like the Most High. The concept of trying to become your own god is satanic. It comes from Satan because Satan was the one who preached that that heresy. So sinless perfectionism, you're trying to become your own god. You're trying you're trying to become sinless like God. You know what Revelation f uh, fifteen four and uh, second or first Samuel chapter two verse two says? Both of those verses say that God is the only one that's holy. God is the only one that's without iniquity. You're not holy without Jesus Christ. And Revelation three seventeen talks about how you're spiritually naked. You know, if you're not clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you're spiritually naked. That's what it comes down to. So, yeah, sinless perfectionism is a satanic heresy. It, it is truly a form of Satanism. Verse 6. Behold, thou desirest the truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, uh, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be wither, whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out mine iniquities. So David is really convicted over his sins. He's really guilty over what over his sins that he committed. 
So yes, David committed sins, but look at the result. He was punished, and look how guilty he is in this in this passage here in this psalm. Uh, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Uh, verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Sorry to all the non-dispensational heretics out there, you know, who say, oh, they are saved by faith alone in the Old Testament. Then what do you do with this? You know, Ephesians 1.13 and Ephesians 4.30 both say, and also 2 Corinthians 1.21 and 22, both say that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay, but Psalm 51.11, David is, is asking God, don't take the Holy Spirit from me. Please don't take the Holy Spirit from me. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So they were not sealed with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament because there would have been no reason for David to ask God, take not that Holy Spirit from me if he was sealed with the Holy Spirit because you can't have the Holy Spirit taken from you if you're sealed with it. They were not saved by faith alone in the Old Testament. That's, that's another uh, lie from uh, non-dispensational heretics. Uh, restore me, restore unto me the joy of, sal of thy salvation and uphold thee with thy free spirit. Then I will reach... Our teach transgressions, transgresses thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Look at this. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. What's he referring to? You know, the fact that he murdered, purposely uh, murdered. He didn't outright do it, but he knew he was going to he was gonna have Uriah murdered by sending him to the battle. So it was essentially murder. So he did have blood on his hands. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. That's what happened. Oh Lord, uh, what's my cat doing? My cat is just behaving up, just waking up. O oh Lord, uh, verse 15, O oh Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth, shall I show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifice, look at this. Here's a really good verse that Jack Smack 7 7 does not seem to like very much. Psalm 51 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. You know, contrite and broken. You're humble. You're broken over your sins. Something Jack Smack 7 7 does not like. Because he's never experienced it. He's still lost in, in a hellbound sinner. You know, he's still lost in dead and trespassed and sins on its way to hell. He's never experienced the uh, God the sorrow over sins. He mocks that. He makes fun of that. Verse 18. Do. Good in thy pleasure unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Okay, in Psalm 51, David was ashamed of his sins. He was not trying to justify his sins like Jack Smack 7 7 does. So, I wanted to show you guys that. Uh, watch out for this false antinomian gospel of Jack Smack 7 7 and his cult that he runs of antinomian heretics. Uh, they're trying to get you to defend your sin. They're trying to get you to misuse liberty as an occasion to the flesh, like Galatians 5.13 talks about. So don't be deceived by Jack Smack 7, 7. Sorry, I had something in my throat. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye.